the climate crisis to me feels like the most pressing issue of our time. Yeah. It's the most pressing issue of our generation. It's like I said, an existential threat. For us in Palau, it's affected like our weather patterns. So right now we have a lot more rainy seasons than there used to be. We also have a lot more storms. So like in the last decade, there have been three typhoons. What? And before that, over 50 years, there was only like one huge typhoon. I don't want to dwell on like the hopelessness of it because that's not going to get us anywhere. True. What it has taught me is that I want to like strategize and think of how we can like make things go faster. What gives me hope is that people care. Yeah. Uh, people care about each other, I think. Deep down inside, we're here because we care about the future of humanity. And I think the more we tap into the heart of the issues, um, the more progress we can make, really. Hello, welcome to Earth Talk, the podcast for people and the planet. A space where we talk about global challenges from different perspectives, whilst we try to focus on solutions and reasons to be hopeful in times like these. I'm Leo Holdak, and thank you for tuning in. Hello, welcome to today's episode. Today our dear guest is Ivory. She is a youth climate negotiator uh, from the islands of Palau. So thank you so much for taking your time being here. And first, how are you? Oh, thank you, Leo, for having me. I'm doing fine. It's been an exhausting almost three weeks here for me. Wow. Um, I came to Egypt with my delegation from the islands of Palau to do our coordination meetings the first week and then COP began and now we're in the second week of COP but in total it's going to have been three weeks for us very long time so a little worn out today but um, hopeful that uh, things will be closed off in the next day or two hopefully I get it so um, you already mentioned some things which I will like soon uh, dive into but just for the people who are right now listening and maybe they don't know you uh, do you mind to introduce yourself a little bit and also away from Yeah, definitely. So I'm Ivory and I'm from the islands of Palau. For those of you who don't know, Palau is in the Western Pacific Ocean, um, north of Indonesia and east of the Philippines. Yeah. So um, the Pacific is a big place, but we're one of the countries there. We are a country, a young country at that. We're 28 years old. Wow. So about our age, which is really funny. Just one year older than me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but we've been like uh, peoples for almost 3,000 years. Um, yeah. And we were under German colonization for a while, um, and then Japanese, and then also we were under the U.S. trusteeship after World War II, until we gained our independence fully. Wow, I didn't know that to be quite serious. And this is like already like, man, like I'm, I'm just, I just need to say sorry that that me as a German, I actually don't know about that fact. This is really not good. Oh no worries. But it's good. Yeah. Like this is a space for learning. So thank you exactly. for sharing that. Um, so maybe um, for the people right now also listening, they don't know how Palau looks like. They don't know how it feels, how does it taste, I don't know how does it smell. So maybe you can get just give us like a small introduction, like how your home, uh, yeah, how your home is. Yes, for sure. So it's like they say an archipelago of islands. So we have 300 islands. Wow. Um, we're home to this world famous UNESCO heritage site, which they call rock islands. So a rock island is pretty much like a huge piece of limestone volcanic rock that comes up out of the ocean. And then there's a bunch of trees and vegetation that grow on this rock. Yeah. Um, but then there's areas of land, of course, where most of us live. Uh, most of us actually live um, on three main islands. And for example, um, the main island where I live is a population of about 12,000 people. Mm -hmm. um, but in total, in Palau, we have a population of 18,000 people. So it's so small. <laughs> <laughs> it's small, but we say we're a large ocean state. So yeah, yeah. we're a small island, but a large ocean state because our ocean is actually... Um, the exclusive economic zone is the size of France. Oh, wow. So when you okay. think of it in that context, everything is much bigger. That's yeah. true. That's true. It doesn't feel small, though. I have to say, like, you can drive across the main island probably within an hour, like mm -hmm. from one point to the other. And what you drive across, you see like a lot of jungle, um, 
it's humid. It's hot. Uh, <laughs> it's I think they say like maybe eighty seven degrees Fahrenheit mm-hmm. and humid, very humid. But then we have like um, roads that have water like on each side, yeah. so we call those roads causeways. Uh, we're not like very flat, I have to say, like compared yeah. to maybe some other beach and islands like people have in mind when they think of islands. We are. Um, geography. We have some hills. We have jungles. Um, my favorite parts of exploring when I'm back home is uh, the waterfalls. Oh, we have wow. gorgeous waterfalls, but we're mostly known as a dive destination. So people come um, in order to see our diverse ecosystem of fish and coral reefs. Wow. Um, yeah. This sounds like to me serious, like like the paradise. <laughs> You're welcome to come anytime. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, can you maybe just like give us like a small, uh, maybe share like a small memory you have, maybe of one beautiful thing you you experienced under the water, maybe when you were diving. Yeah, for sure. Um, just this summer, I swam and dove uh, with manta rays. So, uh, I would say like the manta rays were maybe like four or five feet away from me and we were kneeling down at what they call like a feeding station Mm -hmm. so that's where mantas they come and they like hover across this area to get food and then they like swim away then they come back so manta rays are really angelic uh, beings and they they travel usually in groups and it was it was so magical to see. I love manta rays. I also saw dolphins, not while diving, but um, while we were on a boat, we saw a school of uh, dolphins, and that was also really magical. I Wild ima- dolphins, yeah. I can imagine. I can imagine. Um, <clears throat> so somehow you <laughs> you made all your way from this beautiful place, like uh, surrounded by water. Uh, well, also we are surrounded here by water, but somehow we're like in the middle of the desert. It is like it is like we are now in Shamik Sheikh in Egypt at the COP27 and you are here. So um, I can imagine as this is a climate conference that you are also involved in the work about climate somehow. Can you maybe give us like, a, yeah, just share a little bit how the climate crisis is also affecting then your home Um and also, this is a just. I just want to add right away. This is a space for your for yourselves, and I just want that you feel comfortable in this space as we're talking. And I can imagine that sometimes talking about the climate crisis is difficult. So please share what you would like to share and talk about the things you want to talk about, and always navigate the way that you feel safe. Thank you for that. Yes, I would say for us in the Pacific, the climate crisis is like an existential crisis. Yeah. Because like people my age are already facing um, like the loss of our culture uh, due to globalization and this loss of culture and then compound that with the idea of like potentially losing like your homeland. Uh, Land for us is very significant. Usually land is owned by families and clans. Um, that loss of land due to sea level rise is uh, really, really terrifying, to be honest. Of course. Um, and yeah, I would say that for us in Palau, it's affected like our weather patterns. So right now we have a lot more rainy seasons than there used to be. We also have a lot more storms. So like in the last decade, there have been three typhoons. What? And before that, over 50 years, there was only like one huge typhoon. Wow. And like when I was in Palau over the summer um, with my mom, like we had a typhoon um, that knocked out like our electricity system because we have one grid. And um, (laughs) when that happens, it also knocks out like your access to like water. So our house didn't have water and we live like in what we call like the town, you know. So it affected the whole island. People didn't have electricity or water for like two or three days. And how you get... um, water or electricity in those cases is some people have like backup generators or we had to like go take showers at hotel rooms because they have their own power source um so honestly it affects every part of our life um it also affects like our animal and nature um animals and nature there for example like our coral reefs um they have been experiencing extreme weather especially extreme heat and ocean acidification And this is really sad and also really um, devastating for reef fish that feed on these coral reefs. And for us, like as islanders, we really rely on fish as a main staple of our diet. 
especially um, we prefer eating reef fish. So if corals are dying and fish don't have food to eat, it affects like everything. It affects our diet as well and our food security there. This is so, <laughs> so fucked up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'm sorry to, to hear that, to be quite serious. And as you were, as you just not, as you mentioned that um, families are losing their lands and stuff, as we were talking about losing the lands, maybe it's just like, maybe also really important to just acknowledge like the fact that you, you were like colonized by Germany. You're just like a country which is just 28 years old before we maybe like dive into the topic, like why you're here, like what you're doing actually, mm -hmm. actually on the field here. Maybe it would be just like be really valuable for the listeners also to understand because I think many people right now listening are from Germany, how Germany was colonizing uh, Palau and which effects did it have and how was the historical context? Maybe you can just give us like a small brief context of that. Yeah, for sure. The main reason the Germans were there uh, was for phosphate mining. They came to our islands as well as other islands to source these important mineral resources. Yeah. Um, so back in the day, they called this group of islands in the Western Pacific the Karolinen Inseln. Mm -hmm. um, and at the time when they came, like they also um, phased out some of our traditional like uh, customs. For example, we used to do traditional tattooing. Okay. And um, when the Germans came, like that practice, like they stopped it from being done because it was just taking up so much time. Uh, it was taking up time away from like people working to do the mining and to do other activities. And I can tell you today, there is nobody left in our country that knows how to do that really? kind of tattooing. Yeah. What the so fuck? that's one like loss of like so such a big, it's such a big loss. Yeah, and those are things that are common, but. You hear about it happening, I think, everywhere in other parts of the world. Um, but yeah, with the German colonies, uh, German occupation, it was mostly for this mining. Yeah. And then they left after World War II. The one good thing I have to say that did like um, happen during that time was that our culture was documented in writing. So if our first like um, written history was actually written in German yeah. by these two anthropologists. Um, Their last name was Krema, so it was a man and his wife. Yeah. Um, and it was only up until like maybe 10 years ago that we found finally were able to translate their study and research from German into English so that we can understand it. Mm -hmm. And that has been helpful just so that um, our generation can learn like how things were being done in the early 1900s. Because like I said, some of these traditional knowledge um, has already been lost. Yeah, of yeah. course. Ah, like, I'm talking to so many people on in, in in this podcast where who are like who are directly affected by the colonization, and I'm just like I'm just, I'm just like so fed up. Like, what the fuck? Like, I can't like wrap my head around the fact that this hap this is still happening. It happened. Like, it's and also don't 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 get me wrong. I don't want to pity myself because such a privileged position from which I'm talking. But it's just like so frustrating to hear. Um. But well, still to um, to now, um, somehow you made your way to Egypt from Palau. Like it was, I think it's like a quite a long travel. So can you maybe tell us a little bit like why you're here and what is your impression so far from being here? Yeah, well, I actually have been living in Germany for the last year. So okay. I moved from Palau to Germany. Okay. But my colleagues from Palau who came here, I can tell you they traveled like 30 plus hours. Yeah. And it's not easy also being away from home. Like, at least as young people, we don't have like children, you know, that are waiting for us back home necessarily. But it's a really hard journey to be here for three weeks. But it's important to all of us. It's important for us to be here because um, we need our voices to be heard yeah. in these negotiation and meeting rooms. So my particular role here is as a climate negotiator. I follow carbon markets and I support Palau's Office of Climate Change in that. Yeah. And so really what I do is that I help them um, prepare like our positions on this particular thematic area and coordinate with other small island developing states um, in the AEOSIS group. So it's important that we all as uh, small islands, even if we're uh, in different regions, to share and elevate our voices together. It gives us like a stronger voice. And yeah, um, it's also like we face similar issues, obviously. Um, 
due to climate change, and hence it's important for us to come together and talk about the different areas uh, that are important to us and be able to put our arguments on the table uh, amongst other big groups, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's the AOSIS group uh, speaking to the African group, speaking to the ILAC, the Latin American group. And for us to come together in this way is very important. It's important for us as Pacific Islanders to be here because we're at the front lines of climate change and our countries are going to be the first to disappear. Um, so it's just it's just critical. No matter how long it takes for us to come here and uh, no matter how much family we have staying at home we're doing this for them and really i can say that from all the pacific islander youth we all have this uh, innate sense of purpose like we have a reason to be here um we really feel like we're doing this for our families back home and it's important work um yeah so that's why we're here <laughs> i get that yeah and um how do you feel Is that working out or like um, how is your experience now actually being here on the ground and like being in those negotiation rooms? Yeah, it's my first cop. So it's really like an eye opening experience. Um, yeah, I would say that it really sometimes feels like things take time. You really learn that these processes have been going on for many years And patience is a really important virtue to have here, something I've learned. Yeah. Um, also, like, I would say the two most important, like, things when it comes to negotiations are learning how to communicate your ideas and second, learning how to compromise. I don't even like the word compromise at this point, but this is part of the negotiations, you know? And... Um, when I say compromise, it's firstly knowing what issues you're not going to budge on, you know, what's your uh, borderline, what's your red line, as they call it. And for us, um, as small island developing states, like the most important issue I think here is loss and damage. And our red line is we need to start this loss and damage fund now at this cup. We need to implement that fund. Um, and that's like where we are right now I guess so for the people right now listening and maybe they don't know what the lost and mm -hmm. damaged fund is like what does it mean uh, for you or yeah. not, not only for you but like in general here yeah so essentially um Here at the UNF Triple C and at the COPS, they uh, follow different thematic areas. Usually, they follow mitigation um, or adaptation. And now at this COP, they're speaking about like this, perhaps like a third pathway called loss and damage. Well, how you can think of it is like a way to account and finance um, damages that have been done that are due to climate change. So, um, really purely speaking, like imagine like with the recent typhoon we had back home. Um, let's say like the hospital was damaged or like our power supply like was severely impacted. Um, countries like ours need access to that finance in order to rebuild after big um, storms like that. I see, I see. And um, before um, we like maybe talk about the things you would like to wish that things would be like, like how the negotiation would turn out to you and uh, to turn out for you. But as you just mes mentioned again, loss and damage, and also you mentioned like how the typhoon was hitting your home. Um, we already talked about it a little bit early, but I still I just want to like get this like more clear. I'm a really privileged person that because I was, no, my home is not right away hit by the climate crisis as badly as your home. Um, Just that we have like a better understanding. What do you feel when you think about the word climate change or climate crisis? Like, mm. what does it really mean to you that we really like understand like the the the, the importance and the severity uh, that you are here? Yeah, I would say the climate crisis to me feels like the most pressing issue of our time. Yeah, it's the most pressing issue of our generation. Um, It's, like I said, an existential threat. Like, it's us waking up every day thinking about what the future will look like. Um, it's us, like, sometimes feeling hopeless, I think, at yeah. what the world would be in 2050. Um, and for me personally, like, I am hopeful that things will change massively by 2030. Like, 
in my mind, I'm like, I'm going to keep fighting doing this. And at 2030, I want to see how the world will be because I really think after 2030, if things don't change, I don't know. Like, I don't know if we'll have like a good home to like live in. Yeah. Which I don't even want to think about, honestly. Yeah, of but course not. Of course really, not. Really, this is like the point we're at. Um, and so I think the climate crisis is like, it's personal, it's tangible. Um, it's the disappearance of n nature. It's the disappearance of lands. Um, it's the disappearance of homes, really, for people. And it impacts all of us. So no matter where you live, I think everybody knows, like, in some ways they're affected by it, you know. Of course. And in Germany right now, it's like the oil crisis, prices are so high. Like, you know, and the fact that even though Germany wanted to, like, um, advance more in, like, renewable energies, but because, like, the oil prices are so high, they might have to go to coal. All that discussion is, like, really disheartening for us that it seems like maybe we're going to go backwards. But I know that, like, the government leaders are trying to do their best, you know, and they're trying to figure out how they can continue with their climate commitments in, like, the most ethical way and also not, like... I guess, make the lives of their own citizens difficult. Um, so I think what we need to do is like facilitate collaboration amongst countries. Like there's no pointing fingers like at this stage because that time has already passed us. Like we can't be arguing still about it. We have to be collaborating. Um, and I think that's what the negotiations are for. Therefore, this spirit of collaboration, we're all working towards this like common goal. Um, in my opinion, they should be working faster. <laughs> yeah, of course. And we as young people know that we get so much done working together and we can we can make changes in such short amount of time that I just wish that I saw like more of the way that we worked with each other um, reflected in the negotiation rooms. I feel like that's still lacking if I'm being honest. Yeah, I can totally understand your perspective like that things are going way too slow <laughs> and it can be so frustrating because you know or I can imagine that you just know like what is on like the table and what's on the brink of being lost and then the people just like talking so slow and blocking and blocking and I think it can be really, really difficult. But my question would be, um, somehow you're still here, somehow you're still talking to me. Like when I met you like the first time, I felt that you were like a person with a good vibe, that you were still smiling. And of course you can like try and inside and smile outside. Uh, but still somehow I feel that you have like some kind of a power that you're still staying strong. So, um, What do you reckon? Like, what? Like, how do you keep up, and how how do you keep keep going when things are so difficult? And you know, like, wow, like, I don't know how my future will look like, and future generations who can or cannot like live in my home. So, like, I don't know. I'm just like, maybe you can just give us like a small uh, insight in your in your in your head that we understand how you still keep on going. Yeah, I would say it's because I know my purpose. I know why I'm here. Um, and I'm very encouraged to be around other young people yeah. um, in these spaces, like really being here and seeing climate activists like you, meeting people like that, like really inspire me. It shows me that our generation really cares. Um, and I think what it has taught me is I don't want to dwell on like the hopelessness of it because that's not going to get us anywhere. True. What it has taught me is that I want to like strategize and think of how we can like make things go faster. How can we um, change the view of countries, the view of people um, to beat this climate crisis in the next decade? Like right now it's important to be here because I understand that policies, governments need to implement changes that trickle down to your businesses, to communities uh, in the global north and in the global south, yeah? And I feel like the reason we're here is because we're discussing these policies that need to be implemented. Um, at the same time, I think there's a really, like, still a divide between, like, the activism actions on the ground and these, like, policy spaces Because, like, I'm in rooms where we're discussing words, text. Like, you sometimes feel disconnected from, like, the purpose. And so I really constantly have to remind myself, like, why I'm here. And I have a very strong devotion to, like, my island, my home. Yeah, and that's why I'm here. And um, 
yeah, I'm encouraged by being around other people, like-minded people. Um, I think going forward, I also am going to explore uh, more collaborations with like how we can include maybe private sector companies um, that are in this fight with us, for example, like how we can implement more renewable energy, how we can do also like adaptation. How can we do the things we need to get done in a faster way? Because like right now, are we going to just wait till we get money from, you know, like the global north the, to our home? I don't know if I can wait that long, but if like a big company like a Google or a Salesforce or something can support projects that we do back home and maybe that's faster, I mean, I'd be open to looking at it. I do think there's some, you know, you have to be careful because you don't want like private companies to influence like your country, of course, ever. Um, but at the same time, I think we just need to like think bigger and we need to connect like our like youth activism work our uh, policy work and like private companies that have some like cool solutions innovative solutions um out there and i would say like just as young people here um at these kind of conferences like i want us to like there's we're here you can tell most young people who are here are here in like the activism space which i think is critical and i also want to see them in the negotiation space i because I'm telling you, if there's more people of our generation sitting in those rooms together, we would have gotten a lot more done in a lot, like, faster time. I get that. <laughs> True. And, I mean, you already mentioned some things. But, um, like, imagine um, you are, like, the person leading now those conversations. And um, um, you can bring up, the ta uh, like, the, the solutions you have in your, in your mind on the table. So, can you... As this podcast is also like trying to focus like in the difficult time on solutions and also what gives people hope and, and hope in general, do you mind to um, say a little bit maybe some solutions you have in your mind? It's like such a big topic like the climate crisis itself, but maybe you can narrow it down to a certain points which are important to you um, that we yeah that we know like what you're fighting for somehow. Yeah, um, I would say for every person you ask, like the solutions will be different because it's really what solution and what are the priorities that are needed in your country where yeah. you're from. So I guess I can only speak about you know where I'm from really, but I would say um, our issue right now is really we have to begin doing adaptation, um, and so solutions really it means how do we find innovative ways like to utilize uh, natural ecosystems that are already doing uh, the work of adaptation. For example, our mangrove ecosystems are already uh, protecting us against like high sea level rise. How do we uh, learn from nature? How do we implement the solutions that nature is already doing? Um, those are like I would say more cost effective ways mm -hmm. and maybe things we can do right now. Um, but I also am very interested in seeing us like transition to renewable energy. Um, and especially back home, like because we're an island, our, we import fossil fuels still. Uh, we rely on like one power grid system. Yeah. Like, and we don't want to. We've already set ambitious targets to go 45% renewable by 2025. We want to be 45% renewable and we want to be 100% renewable by 2030. Like, I want to see big countries do those same ambitious targets. Yeah. And we are already committing to that and we're doing everything we can to mm -hmm. find the financing to do those things. Um, but in terms of innovation in islands, like what that looks like when it comes to renewable energy, it could be like offshore wind or it could be ocean thermal, it could be tidal, wave energy. Like I want to see that implemented in the place where I'm from. And I guess... Um, to add to it too, like we have adaptation, we have mitigation, and when it comes to loss and damage, there's also uh, financing that's been proposed that, you know, comes through whether it's insurance or whether it's um, like bonds. There's innovative like financing solutions, but really what we need at this point in time is just for countries to say that, yes, they're committing to that fund. Mm -hmm. We can organize and iron out the details at the next COP, but right now it's really a political issue more than it is like a logistical issue, I would say. 
Um, so in terms of innovation, I th- say islands are full of them. We've uh, survived for many years. We've navigated across oceans. Um, so we're very resilient people, Pacific Islanders. All islanders are resilient people, really. Yeah. But especially for us in the Pacific, we've navigated um, across the oceans. We've had to figure out um, how to live with nature. Mm-hmm. And like... The ocean, for example, is a topic that hasn't been included very much uh, in this like climate change dialogue. It only started to be included um, at the last COP, I believe. Yeah. Uh, but at this COP, we now have an ocean pavilion. We have a youth pavilion for the first time. And I want to see like the ocean, I think, be a bigger player in this because it covers 70% of our world. And without um, actually addressing how it's like a solution mm-hmm. um, to the climate crisis, I think we're not going to get very far. When I say it's a solution, it's um, a way, it's it's already sequestering carbon in the atmosphere. So yeah. what I mean, like, we need to protect more of those spaces. And for us in Palau, we started already protecting um, 80% of, like, our exclusive economic zone. Wow. But we really want other countries to really... If you're a coastal country, if you're an island, like really take your ocean space seriously. It's really like it's our warrior to fight climate change. And I think I want uh, more people to think that way. Yeah. Yeah. That's really what I would say. (laughs) Just that we like know how, like in which way are oceans then so crucial? Like uh, I know way too less about that. Maybe you can just like give like a small introduction, not like not too long because I know it's like we can talk forever about that. But just like in which way are oceans like so crucial in tackling the climate crisis and being a solution and a partner in this? Yeah, well, definitely like it's the life in the ocean um, that and it's also the like deep sea itself that yeah. is like a carbon storage uh, ecosystem. But like the life in the ocean that I'm referring to is um, largely also in coastal areas like seagrass or mangroves. They sequester like 10 times or up to 20 times more carbon than like a tropical rainforest in the Amazon. Amazon, right. But we never really talk about it because they haven't been quantified to the same degree um, as like, for example, a rainforest like ecosystem. And I would say that um, I really want the ocean to have like a bigger um, importance here. Uh, and especially when we talk about climate change. Uh, because of that it has like huge carbon sequestration potential it's also uh, the home to so much biodiversity so much life and when we talk about the ocean i know like plastic pollution is one of the biggest uh, issues right now yeah but i mean yeah it, there's so much like we just dump everything in the ocean and it shouldn't be that way so true. like um in palau we actually say that like the mother the land is our mother and the sea is our father oh. so we think of nature as very connected to us i guess as a peoples i get that as you just mentioned that um just for the people right now who are listening and they feel connected to you and they think like hey i want to support you somehow what do you reckon like how is a good way to support your fight and i don't know just like in general like do you have like anything to say for the people right now listening if they want to support you Yeah, I definitely would say that I would love to connect you to my Pacific Island brothers and sisters who are doing really good work, like in activism on the ground as well. Like one group is uh, in particular I want to highlight is Pacific Climate Warriors. Yes. Um, So they're continuing to elevate the uh, voices of Pacific Islanders um, and our struggle against climate change. So I really, really um, would ask like the audience, if you want to contact me, I'll give my information to Leo after. After this and yeah, sure. definitely you can reach out and um, I would say you know if you ever visit and you want to see firsthand what the impacts of climate change are if you love nature if you love the ocean like come and see it for yourself come help us document those things yeah. I think it's important like in uh, these kind of environments to share our stories and I think what's lacking right now are uh, more videos more uh books, more podcasts, more uh, media presence to share the stories of what's going on um, above water and underwater yeah. to the rest of the world. Because when people see it, they can really understand it for themselves. Thank you so much. So maybe as a ending question, I would ask for myself, uh, what gives you hope? And then after, if you want, uh, you can share some ideas, uh, which you maybe didn't mention yet, which I didn't ask, but just maybe as for myself, like a like, uh, ending question 
what gives you still hope in this whole world, which is like sometimes such a mess, but uh, still, what gives you hope? Yeah, what gives me hope is uh, in these multilateral um, spaces where we have to work together, where different cultures meet, different peoples travel from very far to come and discuss really important issues. What gives me hope is that people care. Yeah, uh, People care about each other, I think, deep down inside. Um, We're here because we care about the future of humanity. And I think the more we tap into the heart of the issues, um, the more progress we can make, really. Thank you so much for uh, the things you just shared and also what gives you hope. Um, as I said, this is a space for yourself to express yourself. Um, the last words are yours. So if you want to share like some last ideas or some last thoughts, which we didn't touch upon, um, feel free to do so. And from my side, thank you so much for our conversation we shared. Thank you so much for the work you're doing, that you're still, I don't know, just that you're in such a difficult environment and in, in those negotiation rooms and that you still keep on going. Um, I really, really have so much respect for that work. And thank you so much for being here and sharing your conversation with me. Thank you. Oh, and thank you so much for having me. It's been really a pleasure to be here. Um, and what I would like to share, I guess, as some last words is spend time in nature, connect with the ocean. Um, to the, like this week, and I tried every day, actually, while I've been here in Egypt, to go into the ocean and go snorkel, go see at least some of the life that we have here. Because yeah. you can get stuck in, you know, just talking about text uh, in meetings you can get stuck at this like just talking about the issue but if you don't really understand like how it's affecting the world how it's affecting you then um, you kind of lose hope so I would say to keep hope spend more time in nature spend more time in the ocean um, and yeah that's about it 